Welcome back everyone to the Caldor Center Conference um, and our panel discussion, Secrecy Somewhere Else, Accountability for the Externalized Treatment of Refugees. My name is Riona Moodley. I'm a lawyer, lecturer and researcher at the Keldor Center for International Refugee Law at UNSW and will be acting as today's chair. Before we begin today, I would like to acknowledge the Bejigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land from where I'm joining you. I would also like to pay my respects to their elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are present here today. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our excellent panel of speakers. Uh, I know my brief introduction will not do their work justice, but I will do my best. Um, with us today is Baruz Bishani. Baruz is an award-winning Kurdish Iranian author, journalist, scholar, human rights activist, and filmmaker. He's also an associate professor in social sciences at UNSW. Baruz continues to publish extensively challenging current political discourse and paradigms on asylum. Also with us is Itama Mann, um, who is a professor in the Faculty of Law at the University of Haifa, where he researches international human rights and refugee law, amongst other areas. Alongside his scholarship, he has worked as a legal advisor at the Global Legal Action Network and is the president of Border Forensics. Um, Anna Talbot also joins us. She's an Australian lawyer, strategic litigation network coordinator and PhD candidate at the Keldor Center. Anna has acted in complex litigation, including applications to secure urgent medical care for children and adults detained under Australia's offshore processing policy. Also with us is Ellie Shakiba. Ellie is an Iranian artist, architect, journalist, and documentary filmmaker. She's been highly active in using photography, videography, and art to document and campaign um, about the mistreatment of people and conditions suffered on Nauru. Before we begin um, today, just a quick note on the format. We will have 40 minutes of moderated discussion between each of our speakers, um, followed by a 15 minute Q&A. Audience members are welcome to post their questions through the Q&A function at any time, and we'll try to integrate them into our final 15 minutes. To begin, um, I just wanted to quickly set the scene for today's talk. Over the last three decades, we've seen a proliferation of efforts undertaken by states, particularly those in the global north, to shift measures of migration control further away from their territories in an effort to obstruct, deter, and otherwise deny people the right to seek asylum there. As many of you know, these measures are wide and varied. Amongst the most notorious are those presently implemented in Australia and copied elsewhere, including Europe. These practices include, but are not limited to, maritime interceptions, boat pushbacks, as well as transferring and imprisoning people in offshore detention centres. Such measures are also usually characterised by a high degree of secrecy, lack of transparency, and limited external and judicial oversight. By shifting migration control outside their territories and the public gates, states seek not only to outsource responsibility elsewhere, but evade legal accountability for their actions. Intermixed in this are also questions of accountability for private actors carrying out these operations at the behest of states. On today's panel, we will be discussing not only the issues of accountability raised by externalization practices, but also the legal and non-legal mechanisms that are being used to challenge and hold states as well as non-state actors to account for their treatment of people seeking asylum. To kick off today, uh, our discussion today, I thought we might begin by opening it up to the panel to talk through some of the discrete ways in which governments evade accountability through the use of externalization policies. Um, Itima, if we could start with you, what do you see as being some of the primary features or mechanisms being employed by states to evade accountability? Yeah, uh, thank you so much. And first, I would like to say also thanks for the invitation and what a pleasure and an honor it is to be here with you today uh, with this team panel and with uh, all the guests that uh, have joined us from various parts of the world. 
Um, in terms of the accountability gap, I think that a good way to analyze this um, from a legal um, and a legal theory perspective is to think about um, constitutional law generally first, uh, in which case we, in, demo in democratic context, uh, we think that executive power needs to be checked by judicial branches. And this, of course, doesn't always happen. But in the context of externalization, there is a kind of systematic push by executive actors to act precisely where they're bifurcated, they're dis uh, detached from uh, the oversight of judiciaries. But this uh, legal analysis, legal political analysis would not suffice uh, without a kind of uh, global political economy angle as well, because the places where executive actors choose to act, if it is Nauru, um, or if it is uh, certain countries in Northern and Western Africa uh, from European actors, or um, Central America, if we're talking about the United States, there are all countries that are <clears throat> in an economic disadvantage, enormous disparity of wealth. And so these countries uh, end up needing to sell these services and are really um, dependent on doing the dirty work for countries in the global north. I think that's the kind of basic um, dynamic that has been going on for at least two decades now. Thanks, thanks for that reflection, Itamar. Uh, Beruz, if I can turn to you, um, just to talk on this a bit further, can you provide some of your insights and views on the actions um, that governments are taking and the narratives that they're employing to evade accountability. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here with you, all of you, Allah, uh, Itmar. Um, uh, actually, I think uh, so we should let uh, think about the whole policy uh, and whole policy established on uh, colonialism mentality. I think that is the root of uh, this, you know, uh, that, and it, actually it is a kind of uh, classic version of colonialism. So it's not, uh, you know, really we cannot compare it with other kind of colonialism in other parts of the world because they are obviously using uh, Manus Island and those, uh, or Nauru and those uh, poor countries as a land of exile. You know, they use them as a, a cage. So that is very important that we think about it. We really cannot analyze this, understand it without looking at this colonialism mentality. And that allowed a country like Australia, you know, it is a kind of imperialism, you know, uh, that uh, let a country like Australia to go and have a, not really negotiation, force those countries to accept this offer, you know, and sell their land to be a cage. And in uh, the UK, we see that how they use the uh, Rwanda, you know. So that mentality, I think, is important that we should understand that. And uh, it's quite inter interesting that in Manus Island, in that case, we have a kind of uh, internal colonialism as well. Because this money that Australia offered to PNG, actually that money goes to the politician they, in Port Mosby, in the capital city, they put that money in their pocket. And people of Manus Island even didn't get any, you know, benefit of that. And I could see when I was there that how people in that island were frustrated that how uh, Port Mosby is uh, treating them. So it's not actually only about uh, Australia. It is a kind of internal colonialism as well. So that is quite interesting. And also, I should mention this. Uh, so probably we will have this chance to talk about it, that just imagine refugees, many detainees in a cage, in a prison camp, and uh, that overlap 
the law inside the prison camp with the out of the prison camp. <clears throat> and many times we didn't know really who is responsible for that. If something happened, something wrong happened, a violence happened, someone killed in the prison camp, who is responsible for that? And so I have many examples. I can't talk about it. I think, uh, so I just I'll let you continue. We can't talk about that. There were many big cases in Manus Island. Some uh, case that the, some officers, Australian officers raped the local woman and how they left the system, helped them to escape from the law. Uh, also with how Reza Barati was killed. And we know that some Australian officers were responsible. They were among those people who killed Reza Barati. There are many cases actually that we can talk about it and, uh, but, uh, so I just uh, let you continue. So we can get back to this and I can talk about these cases in details and how uh, generally they put refugees in a situation that they are victim of law and in the same time out of law. How we uh, refugees cannot have access to court, you know, to the uh, court system in a way that other people do, like uh, Djokovic was the biggest case that we can talk about it. And that case actually exposed the whole system, that whole refugees are struggling with the dictatorship system. They created, they established a dictatorship system. So we can talk about all of this in details. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Beruz. I, I think you've raised a really important point about the legal vacuum that's created within these detention centres. Um, and I, can I bring you in on that point? Um, Practising as an Australian lawyer, um, can you talk through a bit more about that legal vacuum and what's created it? Yes, of course. Thank you, Riona. Um, before I do, I just want to acknowledge that um, I'm coming in from Gadigal land and pay my respects to elders past and present of Gadigal people and of all of the Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people around Australia. Um, so, yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right, Baruz. Um, and I don't, this is clearly the purpose of the policy is to remove the people who have been sent there um, from access to the Australian legal system. I was battling the, the legal system for a number of years, um, seeking to, as, as Riona was saying, I was working to um, assist people to access urgent medical care uh, that the minister was refusing to provide to them. So there was expert reports being prepared, those experts were saying that the people were urgently unwell, um, their lives were at risk in a number of cases, and yet the minister refused to provide the medical care because the minister didn't want those people to have access to the Australian legal system. Um, the health si si situation was dire. Uh, if you're interested in finding out more about that health situation, uh, particularly those of you who might be in countries where this system might be starting soon, depending on how it goes in the courts. Um, I would recommend having a look at the Medicine Sans Frontier report uh, on Nauru, uh, published in 2018. It's um, it, it was a really serious situation. MSF said that um, it was some of the worst mental health that they had seen in any of the any of the places that they had been working, including with survivors of um, torture. Um, so yes, I think that's exactly the purpose of this system. And what it means is our ability as lawyers, I mean, our ability as lawyers to assist people was incredibly restricted. We were not able to assist even a fraction of the people that asked us for help you literally had to be dying for us to be able to take action in the courts or close enough to it um, or to be suffering, a, you know, permanent 
uh, in capacity or, or on the verge of doing that. And the reason for that was that we don't have we don't have a human rights framework really in Australia that's accessible. There's certainly nothing like the European Court of Human Rights here or the Inter-American System of Human Rights or the African System of Human Rights. There's not even constitutional protection for human rights as you were talking about, Itamar. Um, all we have here is tort law. And so the only way that we were able to um, secure healthcare for our clients was to demonstrate to the courts that the situation was as urgent as it was. And then the courts would force the minister to uh, provide the health care that the experts said that they needed. So the, the legal situation was very, very serious and it was completely purposeful. No, thanks. Thanks, Anna, for, for sharing those insights um, into the challenges that, that you as lawyers were facing as well um, in terms of allowing for clients to actually put forward their cases and navigating the Australian system. Um, Elahi, um, can I bring you in? Uh, what, what, in your view, are some of the, the key accountability gaps? Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our conference today. Uh, I agree with Beirut that the whole idea of offshore detention center needs to be held to account, study and assess to see was this policy ever legal? According to 1951 UN Refugee Convention and 1967 protocol, you cannot return or send a refugee to a country where there could be, not even there is, there could be a threat to their lives and freedom. So why was this policy ever created? And it was, and a strategy that worked greatly for them. Again, as Belus just mentioned, there are a lot of similarity in our situation. Uh, whatever the problem was, any issue that we had, it doesn't matter if it is a serious health issue or a safety matter or even sexual assault or a mysterious death of an asylum seeker or refugee. We had to write a lot of requests and complaints to receive a response, even in terms of housing. Uh, after like some asylum seekers were being assessed and were became Guinean refugees and there were no accommodation for them to leave and they had to stay inside the detention center. They, they had to write hundreds of requests and complaints that we cannot stay inside the tension anymore. And the response from ABF was that this is not related to us. This is a matter that you should take to Nauru government. And they had to go through the crazy way to communicate with someone from Nauru government. And there is again, no response. And they refer you to Australian government. So it's uh, refugees and asylum seekers who already have been through a lot of traumas that now are not only living in an endless indefinite detention and endless limbo, they also receiving no response and their basic human rights are being ignored all the time. Yeah, thanks. thanks, Ellie, for sharing those insights with us. And um, having identified some of these broader accountability gaps that we see, I'm sure the question that many in the audience uh, are eager to hear from you all uh, on is this, how can we uh, and how are we uh, challenging and overcoming some of these gaps, specifically what mechanisms and strategies are or should we be using to overcome them? Um, I, of course, would like each of you to have an opportunity to discuss this. Um, perhaps starting with you, Beruz, um, I know that you've previously described writing as a form of resistance, um, talking to your own efforts what practical insights can you share or recommendations do you have on ways to hold government to account? Oh, sorry, Beruz, I think you're um, just on mute. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I think we can talk about the uh, whole government as a system, as a structure. 
So that is in this case is Australian government. So it doesn't matter that is the Labour Party or Liberal Party. So even the government, if changed, still, uh, you know, we can hold them accountable. And also, I think it's very important that the politicians who have been uh, a part of this system, uh, politicians who have had the power or design this system, or they establish this system, I think they should, uh, <clears throat> we should hold them accountable as well, you know? So we cannot just talk about the government. Of course, that is very important, but the uh, politicians like uh, Peter Dutton, you know, these people, you know, they, they are criminal in my perspective, you know, because in many cases, they could uh, help or prevent death. They could prevent persecution, but they didn't. You know, they sometimes they deliberately or because of personal reasons, they uh, did something wrong on the refugees. They uh, put refugees, some individuals in a situation like the, the, that uh, case with the Sri Lanka family, you know, uh, they put them there and also they wasted money there. So even we can uh, hold them accountable for the money that they wasted. It's not only about human rights, you know? So, I mean, we should really think about these two things. Those politicians like uh, uh, Scott Morrison, he was an immigration minister and he proud of that, that he was among those First politicians who established this system. So I think we uh, we should think uh, think about it in that way. And also, uh, uh, the it's not only government, the companies. People often don't talk about them. The companies, security companies, and especially uh, IHMS as a company that has been winning all of the contracts for many years. So that those companies should, uh, we should force them. And actually, uh, always I say that uh, in Australia that if we really want to bring this system down, if we really want to force them, we should first these companies, we should follow the money, where this money, you know, and that is very, because we are not facing only a policy. We are facing an industry. They have established an industry. They have built many prison camps. They have uh, spent so much money to build this uh, industry. And many people, many companies are a part of this uh, industry. And the only victim are refugees because they need the pennies to keep this industry alive. So that's why they always uh, try to find someone. They put the uh, New Zealanders, people with the, <clears throat> their background is New Zealander. They put them in prison, in the, in the detention center, in the, you know why? Because they need these bodies. Always they can find the excuse to put people there. So, I mean, we are facing an industry for challenging this industry, for uh, hold them accountable. We should uh, actually follow these security companies as well. Follow medical company like IHMS and find out how, who is behind these companies, how they all always win these contracts. And if we remember with Paladin company in uh, Manus Island, uh, there was uh, some very good reports by Australian Financial Review about the, that uh, uh, company. And that was just a part of it. You know, that's just a part of it. So there are really good uh, reports uh, about these companies and also Guardian Australia has done some very good reports about this. 
But I think that is very important. And also our biggest aim should be uh, demand and request for um, royal uh, commission. You know, they should investigate the whole policy, you know, about everything, all of the contracts and also how they uh, torture uh, mm -hmm. detainees and also people who have been killed under this system. But uh, as you, everyone say that it's very difficult to get access to legal system in Australia. But I think uh, if we run a strong campaign, you know, we are able to do that because we have enough document, witness, and all of these humanitarian organizations, they have uh, recorded the history of this policy. So we have evidence. Yeah, thank you very much. So Sorry, next time I'll speak uh, little, yeah. Shorter. No, no, that's good. Thank, thank you, Beruz. Yeah. Anna, sorry, you wanted to, to, to jump in? Yeah, just quickly, I couldn't agree more with you, Beruz. I think um, the, the lack of an effective opposition has been a real disaster over the last 20 years in Australia, and the financial accountability is really important. There was an a, a Australian National Audit Office report on this issue a couple of years ago, which agreed with you entirely. So the government's highly aware of this. I'm also concerned that there may be issues of corruption. We, there was essentially a blank check when it came to offshore processing for Australia. Um, we don't know where a lot of this money is going um, and it's cloaked in issues of corporate accountability. So we have an integrity commission starting soon, hopefully, and I hopefully that will offer an opportunity for us to have that interrogation that you're recommending there, Baruz. I think that would be a really important function of that integrity commission to do that work. And I think somebody's put in the Q&A as well, and I think it's a really important point. Um, one of the most important problems with accountability is people continuing to live in fear because of the temporary nature of the protection that they have. A lot of people don't have visas. Those who do have visas are on temporary visas. Um, so one of the easiest ways to secure accountability or to, to ensure that people feel comfortable telling the truth about their experiences is to ensure that they have a situation of permanent safety so that they don't feel afraid that they're going to be sent back to offshore detention or into immigration detention as punishment for telling the truth about their experiences. Thanks. Thanks, Anna. Uh, Itamar, did you want to jump in on this point as well? <clears throat> sure. Um, so first, um, I, I want, I, I was listening to both uh, Beruz and Anna, and I was um, struck by the use of the category of criminality. I, I think that this is a category that um, a number of organizations in Australia, um, and also uh, uh, the Global Legal Action Network, uh, the organization that I uh, work for, we tried to um, kind of uh, push forward with regard to Australia. And I want to say first um, uh, how we got there. And I think that um, this was a 2017 submission to the ICC prosecutor. Um, and I think that already at the time it was clear that countries are learning from each other in terms of these offshoring uh, mechanisms. And it um, then appeared that um, Australia is not only at the forefront, um, I mean, it, it was before everyone else in, in, in many of the practices, um, it was already clear, clear that the, the UK, Denmark are learning from Australia very, in a very, very clear way, very, very directly. And so to attack Australia was not only to hold Australia accountable, it was also to try to stop that domino, uh, the domino effect whereby co different countries in the global north adopt uh, these very harrowing practices and they, they spread. So one can also argue, and I think um, Professor Daniel uh, Gesselbach, who is uh, one of the organizers and the deputy um, director of the Calder Center has argued this in his book, um, that the Australian practices came from the US. And so there is also a history going back of this imperialism and colonialism, if you want to use Beruz's um, term here. And so uh, I think the, the project is to try to insert yourselves 
in moments where you see a kind of weak link and a strategic link that will then uh, be influential in other parts of the world. In the global, uh, sorry, in, in forensic um, oceanography, which is a project that began in 2011, uh, Lorenzo Pisani and Charles Heller started it, um, we, uh, and I started to work with them as a legal advisor, we focused on maritime spaces and on um, violations occurring in maritime spaces um, that um, were outside of view and seemed to be some of the places where the most difficult and harrowing direct forms of violence occur with the least form, of, least aspect of accountability. And the technique was to investigate, to reconstruct the event in great detail, and then to form a litigation strategy based on that reconstruction. Now, I, I don't want, I mean, I can add a lot of details here, but I want to not um, say too much, but I do want to also add a note of caution here. So after more than a decade of working in this area, what we see is that some of these efforts to hold governments accountable are not, um, are, are not working. The ICC basically blocked the way for us. Um, and um, not only that they're not working, in some cases, notably in the European Court of Human Rights, there is a kind of retraction and uh, the rights are not expanded, by, but contracted. And the most important case in this context is ND and NT versus Spain, um, where really the interpretation of the European Convention of Human Rights was very um, conducive to allowing forms of border violence. They talked about the Spanish-Moroccan border, but that, that did, is already spreading to other parts of the European Union. Uh, the, the external um, borders of the European Union. And what I mean to say by this is not to, you know, basically discourage us and say we need to be pessimistic and know our, our limitations. What I want to say is that, you know, what is very, very important here, and other speakers have already emphasized this, is to never see just, you know, the courts alone, never, you know, end there. Uh, the whole, um, you know, uh, new vocabulary that uh, Beruz Bouchani offered in his work to name these violations is just as important in holding, or maybe even more important in holding governments accountable than the legal work that comes at the end stage, because the legal work has to rely on that and it has to uh, uh, win hearts and minds and it needs to change, change mentality. We cannot do less than that if we want to, you know, uh, push push the needle here in any significant way. Um, and I think that what we do see if we want to, want to end with a optimist note after all, is that migrate these migration and refugee movements, they never stop. People do win status in the end of the uh, of the road. some some die on the way, some some are returned to harrowing conditions. But some do win uh, status and bring their family members. And it's not like we're going to win this battle in a dramatic moment that the violations will be over. This is a process, but the process is going in various directions. And some of the directions are towards um, you know, protection that is, uh, and, who, and the people that are first and foremost pushing for this and winning this are the people on the move themselves. And campaigns must always be very much in touch with these people, sorry, um, and, and not um, remove ourselves from that, from focusing on that, the real effects for families. All right. I'm sorry for no, going a little bit you. overboard. Th no, thanks, Itamar. And, and talking about campaigns, Ellie, I think I'd like to bring you in on this. Um, you've been quite extensively engaged on campaigns to bring an end to offshore processing uh, and to having children moved off Nauru. Um, can you talk through your experience, which is linking into what Itamai has just mentioned about finding weak links. In many respects, some of the work that you've done is outside the legal framework, but you've you've sought to find these weak links and often it's it's been through documentary evidence and photographic evidence to highlight uh, what has otherwise been hidden from the view of the public. Can you talk a bit about some of your work? 
of course, for all of these years, I've been using my art to advocate for refugees' rights since I was on Nauru and even last three years that I've been in the United States. Uh, I've been creating paintings called Border Industrial Complex, also known as Border Surveillance Industry, carrying true stories of Nauru and everything that I witnessed. And I also have been making a documentary film called Architect, discussing the specific design of Nauru Detention Center that was built to torture the detainees in terms of who needs to be held to account. Well, who first created the idea of offshore? It was Julia Gillard and then Kevin Rudd for a short period of time. But I will discuss that even through uh, the, the construction of the detention center at the beginning when still labor was on power, the detention center wasn't even built. There were just few tents and a few random transfers to Nauru detention center. That this shortage of facilities or anything made people even think that this is gonna be really temporarily and they're gonna be taken back to Australia. But when Liberal Party took the power, Tony Abbott, Scott Morrison and Peter Dutton, building the prison just started, literally. And uh, we were seeing like all of those private company construct. Oh, I don't know if I can mention. I will. I will call their name in my film anyway. And the way that they were making money in on that island out of vulnerable refugees. And then um, I will discuss that that it was mostly liberal party, and also they spent a lot of money and energy into depicting us as potential terrorists or illiterate people who are a danger to Australian community. I've been trying to break that picture by humanizing refugee in my artwork, in my film, to show the real face of refugees that we were not what the Liberal Party was telling you. Uh, there were a lot of educated, skilled people detained in Nauru Detention Center, a lot of engineers, mechanics, nurses, teachers, people who could be really helpful, useful, and positive in Australia society. And all of those people need to be held to account. And also right now, I think this is very important for labor to be held to account as someone who can really end this because they have the power now. And even right now, after all of these years, people still are having hope in labor that they can do things differently. So I think it's all depend to them and they can change it. They can close offshore detention center, give the right that refugee um, really need and, and they deserve it now after that, all of that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks Ellie for sharing those insights. And I think what we're seeing more of is that trying to um, dismantle the system requires efforts in various ways, both legal and non-legal, um, trying to shift narratives and to also educate the public. Um, a particular issue, um, I, I suppose, that constantly arises is um, governments also seek to justify their policies based on public sentiment. Um, and, and this is quite a big question, and I know we only have a very short period of time, but I, I'd like to turn this to you. Um, when we talk about accountability, to what extent should we also hold civil society accountable um, for the views that then lead uh, ultimately to governments justifying these policies? Uh, I might open it up to the panel. Um, Biruz, would you like to, to comment? Yeah. I think I've, I've written about this a lot, actually, about big, uh, Australian civil society. Uh, because I have been working with many people in Australia and I have been in touch. And uh, so it was not something just we write uh, about Manus or Naro or the whole policy. You know, I've been working with uh, the civil society to uh, for organized uh, 
events, uh, protests, and also all of these things that uh, Allah mentioned, uh, the artworks, uh, you know, all of these works uh, which are very important. And we can talk about this in another time about the resistance knowledge that uh, refugees uh, have been created, you know, through their work uh, alongside a part of civil society in Australia. Uh, but I think what is important that, uh, so it's more mentioned constitution, you know, that as a, like a, the, one of the main uh, roots or issues, but we should add this, that the whole policy established on national security. So that's why refugees cannot really have access to legal system because uh, they have a big excuse. So because of national security, even you are uh, able to announce war against another country because of national security, you are able to justify violation of human rights. And that happened these days in the world, you know? So they established this on national security. That is a very important uh, issue. We should, uh, you know, that, that, that's why they say that because of national security, we uh, just banish these people to those islands and we, we can keep them there uh, whenever we want, you know? And we are not uh, answer, we, we, we don't want to answer. We are not accountable for that. That is very important. So I think the main thing that we can do, that we can aim and think about it, is that even if the detainees, we know that 200 people remain in Port Mosby and Nauru, even if they release them, still the policy exists. Still the government is able to banish people there or treat refugees inside the country in the community to say that, yeah, we, we, we are going to banish you, send you back to Manus and Noro. So that policy still exists. So I think for uh, uh, changing this, for having access to legal system, one of the way is that we challenge the, change the whole policy, you know, that they don't use this word uh, national security. That is very important. Thanks, Behrouz. Um, I might hand it over to each of our other panelists. Um, I know we've got a, a quick couple of minutes uh, for your final thoughts um, before we um, attempt to, to answer some of the, the questions coming through the Q&A. Um, Anna, can I hand it over to you just to comment. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I couldn't agree more, uh, Beirut. I think in, I'll try and give you a two minute, for those of you who don't know, I'll try and give you a two minute history of the Australian, um, of how we got here. So in 2001, uh, that was the first iteration of Nauru, um, which hope, we all hoped we would forget about. What happened there was there was some boats coming um, to Australia. There was some opportunistic photographs taken and they were demonised in the media. It was called, for those of you who are not Australian or old enough, it was called the Children Overboard Affair. And that was really the beginning of the securitisation of um, offshore, of, of refugee issues in Australia. Uh, we then started seeing, so at that point, when you landed on the islands closest to the launching point up near Indonesia, uh, you could claim asylum in Australia, as you can, as far as I understand it, in other countries still today. We started this process of, of reducing Australia's borders to the fact that they don't actually exist anymore. You could land in, you know, theoretically speaking, you could land in a boat in Alice Springs and not be able to claim asylum in the middle of Australia because they've taken away that right. There's this legal fiction that's being created that means that more people need to take the risks of getting on boats because it's it, they need to travel further and they also you can't get family reunification so um, they 
more people have to get on the boats. Um, so more people are being at risk and then the saving lives at sea rhetoric comes into play, which never had to exist before. Thanks, Anna, for providing that context. Itama, I might give you um, a moment to respond. Yeah, just very quickly. Um, if we're talking about civil society, I think that there's two key points. Uh, one is that, uh, there, and this is something that you know we, has been discussed forever, but needs to be on the table here as well. Um, those who commit border violence and perform border violence um, and also uh, support it are oftentimes um, also speaking from a position of relative um, dis economic disempowerment and disadvantage. And there always needs to be this question in the background, not to vilify everyone as simply racist, but to try to also respond to any um, internal economic in inequalities that m their, their racism might be rooted in. But on the other hand, and this is maybe the more challenging point, um, in recent years, um, there has also been put forth a kind of analysis that, um, you know, in some ways, racism is, is, is not something that if we expose and talk about openly and respond to, we will eliminate. There is a kind of deep, um, it, it expresses a deep will to actually commit the violence and that we that, that, that needs to be taken seriously in that way um, as a deep psychological and 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 kind of mental force uh, that is not simply a matter of economic inequalities and so forth. And in that regard, what I can only say is that um, in terms of civil society, uh, action also needs to be rooted, as I said also before, in communities that have also experienced this violence themselves, have histories that uh, are relevant and um, uh, and, and refugee migrant and expatriate communities are a key element of civil society in that regard. Thanks, Irma. Uh, Eli, uh, Eli I can, if I can uh, get you to make some final comments uh, before we take questions from the audience. Okay, about civil society, they can do a lot. They can do a lot. Basically, even only by finding and letting the truth out there and informing other people about the uh, wrong narrative on refugees or other lies that people are being told to all the time, they can, they can raise awareness. They can do a lot by supporting humanitarian organization, calling their representatives. Uh, so uh, civil society can do a lot uh, in terms of making changes by doing all of those acts. Uh, that's it, that's what I can say, or by supporting other projects, other organizations, NGOs that can make change. But the main issue is still, I believe that, yeah, letting the truth out there is really supportive because I believe that, uh, unfortunately, journalism is not doing great <laughs> these days. And this is very important to have the truth out there. Thanks, Ellie. Um, I'm just going to take a question from the audience now um, and put it to the panel. Uh, the question is, can we explore the potential of campaigns similar to the boycott, um, divestment, sanctions, um, movement for offshore detention um, to highlight where the money goes? Is that the question uh, for me? Oh, no, for, for the panel. Uh, Anna, did you want to? Um, yeah, there, there was a really successful campaign um, called the No Business in, in Abuse campaign a number of years ago, um, and that led to a number of companies not renewing their, their uh, contracts in offshore detention. The problem that happened there was with the bottomless pit of money that was available for this um, horrific policy, was that larger and larger contracts started being awarded to more and more obscure companies. Um, we had 
Paladin, as uh, Baruz was mentioned before, I think was a very small family company. There was another company that um, also a very small company that had no experience in in de dealing with offshore detention, but the government continued to award these contracts to companies that would take them. And with the money that was available, there was always a company. So I think there is, it's an avenue to pursue, but it, need, it needs more. It needs also an unwillingness of the government to go beyond a certain point, because if the money can always increase, uh, it, it's not a complete answer, unfortunately. Thanks, Anna. Um, Ellie, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, I also wanted to add that I think it was 2014, I was still inside detention center when Danish government sent a group of people to come and visit our prison and see how the model works as a successful model, as they say. And it was a time when I realized that this is going to be a global issue. And this is like a cancer that is going to be expanding around the world. And what we are hearing about the Rwanda deal in the UK, and also I've heard later about Italy, that they were considering that as a solution as well. So it also makes the issue more important about whatever we are going to do whatever civil societies in Australia, Europe, UK, whatever they can do to just stop it, stop the expanding of border industrial complex or border surveillance industry. And I think another question raised, uh, and I might put this to Beruz, um, the, the question is, would a Royal Commission uh, into detention and systematic uh, cruelty be a possibility in Australia. Um, do you think that that there's enough um, public outrage within Australia to warrant a royal commission being called? Yeah, I think that that is possible. I think a big part of Australian society really are angry about. Uh, this uh, tragedy that created by the government uh, under their name. And also I should mention that when I say the Royal Commission, actually I look at Royal Commission as a part of the system. So I'm not uh, uh, very optimistic that if Royal Commission involved and they investigate that and that's uh, so, but we, uh, you know, just, I think it's important. It, it can be a step you know but as i mentioned before the problem is colonialism mentality that is the problem you know so royal commission is just a part of the system the whole system and about the civil society in australia uh, i forgot to mention in the last question that unfortunately the civil society in australia is very lazy in terms of this and the, the system is able to play with them very easily. How they do that? Because the we, you know, white savior culture. White savior culture allowed the government to play with the, the, the Australian people. That's why we have a concept celebrity refugee. Refugees who become their case become known in the media for a while and when they release them from the detention from the prison camp the whole nation celebrate that and become happy but in the same time they forget that there are hundreds of people in in definite detention for many years no one questioned that just they celebrate that uh, that individual you know because that justified them they they feel happy about it you know so it's very, that, that is a pattern in Australia. Each two years, each three years, we know a refugee or a family. They become very known, they become a national case. And when they release them from the detention, everyone celebrated, but the system still is there. Still people are in the detention. So that is unfortunately, uh, you know that pattern happened a lot and a lot again and again but the civil society 
I, I don't know, they don't question the main issue, which is why they should put people in detention. Thanks, thanks, Beruz. And just leading on from that, and I might address this to Itamar in the chat, um, a few people have been talking about how can we stop um, these sorts of policies um, coming up elsewhere in the world. Um, and I know there's quite a bit of discussion around these policies again in Denmark and the UK and elsewhere in Europe. Uh, what do you see is a, a possible strategy to intersect this um, and to demonstrate to a number of these states and the civil society within Europe that these are not policies that should be followed? Well, first, I think it's uh, uh, worthwhile to also say um, uh, that I'm not speaking from nowhere. I'm speaking from Israel and the Rwanda um, and Uganda deals are alongside Australia. Israel was one of the countries that pioneered this model. And so um, I just want to acknowledge that and put put that forward. Uh, in, in in and so uh, and, and there is a very very interesting line of, of comparison between the two countries. And just to draw a little bit on that experience, um, here uh, the situation is such that we still have returns. We we have we have returns to Rwanda and returns, not returns. These, this, this, I'm sorry for saying uh, this is a kind of third country accepting people that are not from there for money. And um, there was a moment in which the, the, the government uh, has uh, planned to do this without giving some kind of opportunity for consent for migrants and refugees that are returned. And people took to the streets and that model was uh, moved off the table. It's still bad. I'm not saying that this has solved any problems, but the fact that people took to the streets in very large numbers was extremely was was effective. And so, if we're talking transnational, we need to to really foster these transnational networks that allow people from Australia to go and say in a UK publication, you know, we know how this is and this is bad, and please don't do it. And uh, the same for, you know, we need to acknowledge these common experiences that we have at the fault lines between the global north and global south and make it our project to intervene in strategic ways across this cutting line, this global cutting line, uh, because these same processes occur everywhere. We see the same kinds of political backlashes as, uh, against judicial decisions that are progressive, but come without a kind of social uh, foundation. And, and I think that's really the project right now. I'm trying to participate in it in a small way, but um, you know, anyone who can think of their own angle into this will be helpful. Thanks so much, Itamar. Um, I might turn this over to any one of the uh, members of the panel um, to make any final comments. I know we've only got uh, just about 30 seconds left before we'll have to wrap up, but uh, did anyone want to make any final comments on this topic? Anna? Um, I'm very happy to give my time to somebody else if, if you do want to make a comment. But the one thing that I thought is there has been a change recently in Australian politics. There's been a, a huge number, relatively speaking, of independents elected, and they do seem to be sympathetic to this issue. So hopefully this is an opportunity to turn the tide on this. Um, it, it remains to be seen how it works, but I think it's an opportunity that we need to try and grasp. Thanks so much. We're almost out of time. Thank you to all of our wonderful panellists. Um, I know it felt a little bit rushed, but thank you for sharing your insights and thoughts. And thank you to the audience members um, for asking questions. I'm sorry we hadn't had an opportunity to get to all of them. Um, the Caldor Centre Conference will continue tomorrow uh, with a hybrid scholars workshop um, and a closing reception. But this is unfortunately the last virtual panel for the conference. Um, I also wanted to just express our thanks to the conference's um, premier sponsor, UNHCR, and sponsors of Wooten Kearney, Hall and Wilcox, Gilbert and Tobin, uh, Norton Rose, Fulbright, and Vares. Uh, thank you again, Beruz, Itamar, Ellie, and Anna um, for joining us today and sharing your time and thoughts with us.